Today, as part of our course in Russian film and literature, we are watching and commenting on the film by Alexander Dovshenko. The interesting facts about Dovshenko is his background. Yes, he was of Ukrainian descent. He was also a former science teacher, painter, and a diplomat with ties to the Russian Foreign Intelligence Agency. This film was created in 1930 in Kiev. It is called Zimlya, which can be translated into English as Earth, Land, Dirt, or Ground. In our subtitles, we chose to translate it as Land, for reasons you will understand while watching this film. As you can see, it opens with static images and then transitions into animated, moving scenes of Ukrainian land. We see sunflowers, grasslands, hills, fields of wheat, and apples. Sunflowers, by the way, have been a symbol of Ukraine for more than 400 years by now. It is obvious that Davzhenka shows us the importance of land in the lives of Ukrainians. Yes, we see the Ukrainian countryside. The technique Davshenka uses is interesting too, because we see people are not in the center of the frame. Yes, um, but land is given all your attention, as if the director intends for the audience to feel its importance, and that traditionally, in Ukrainian culture, men were tied to the land and cherished it as the most important deity in their lives. The music in the opening is wholesome. And at the same time, suspenseful. The plot begins with the patriarch of the family dying. His name is Semen. According to Ukrainian traditions, the whole family is gathered. We can see all generations, Semen's son, son's wife, then grandchildren and their mother, and finally his oldest grandson, Vasil. We also see Semen's best friend, Petro, talking to him. It is interesting how the expectance of death is accepted by everyone as a natural part of life. Yes, it appears that Semen himself knows exactly when it is his time to transition to the afterlife. When Semen passes away, his friend Petro is expected to say praise to his life, and of course here we see the fragment of Bolshevik propaganda, when even traditional praise is turned down by Dovchenka into Soviet reality. Praise is equivalent to an award from a Bolshevik commissar. Obviously, this is where the director pleases the Soviet government and meets its requirements to instill acceptance of Marxist ideology as something normal in the audience. He exploits the sacred tradition of giving praise to someone who has just died. We also see that Vasil doesn't think highly of his grandfather's achievements. To him, it is nothing but nonsense hard work that his grandfather had to do. And Vasil talks about the new ways, the Bolshevik ways of working the land. We can see Davshenka's use of montage, where his intention is to show how all generations of the family are tied to their land. 
There is a reason why Ukrainians call their land Zimlya Matushka, Zimlya Karmilitsa, which means land mother or the one that feeds you. And we see that everyone appreciates the gifts of the land. The pears and apples are being equally enjoyed by the youngest in the family, and the last wish of the dying Semen is to eat some pears too. When Semen dies, we hear the church bell, but on the screen, instead of the bell, we see a sunflower. Davjenka was regarded as a master of poetic cinema in the USSR, and he did determine the poetic style of Ukrainian cinema for decades to come. Yet, he also stays true to the mission given to him by the Communist Party, the propaganda, to manipulate his audience into believing that the only right way to live is the Marxist way. As a master propagandist trained by the Soviet intelligence service well, Dovchenko meets his audience at their level first. We know that the majority of the Ukrainians did not accept Russia's revolution of 1917. Bolsheviks won the bloody civil war, but although they were able to take over the government, culturally, most Ukrainians despised communism. So, we see that Davchenko begins his film with traditional values of Ukrainian peasants, and to those who are unaware of his intentions, Vasil looks somewhat inadequate and disrespectful in his reactions. Yes, at first we see that the land itself is the main character, then Vasil is introduced. So, how will Davchenko develop his character? Let's see. Solemn respect to the dead is an important tradition. It is obvious that it is a long-standing tradition, and everyone is respectful of it, except Vasil, who for some reason is smiling during his grandfather's last hours. It is unclear whether he is disrespectful to the tradition itself, or the conversation about the afterlife that Semen and Petro are having. The abrupt transition from Semen's peaceful passing away to the scene at a home of a well-to-do peasant family, labeled as Kulaks, reveals the director's true intentions. Even the music abruptly transitions from solemn but peaceful to dramatic and unsettling. This Kulak family is devastated by the news that the Bolshevik plans to take away their land, cattle, and horses to force them to join the Soviet collective farm. Most Ukrainians were opposed to Lenin's collectivization policy. When Davchenko was creating this film, the country has already been devastated by the famines caused by unwise Bolshevik policies of taking away most of the harvest from villages to feed the urban population. Moreover, Ukraine, due to its rich, fertile lands and influenced by the culture and high ethics of old believers who, unlike regular Orthodox Christian peasants, held strong convictions, were hard-working, were energetic, avoided alcohol, and have traditionally supported the country's needs in food, Ukraine wanted to break away from the Soviets. Here we see that as a propagandist, Davchenko portrays Kulaks as a class enemy, hence their grief is shown in satirical, almost comical tones. Men abusive to their women, women bawling when they hear the news about collectivization, a kulak willing to kill his own horse rather than giving it away to the collective farm. All of these are manipulations by the director showing his true intentions to follow the communist party line and portray kulaks as enemies and villains. While in reality, we know that the kulaks, a majority of whom were actually old believers, became the real victims of the Soviet regime. Most of them were stripped of their land and property, some killed, some forcefully resettled to the land in Siberia where they had no chance of survival. These atrocities will follow in the 1930s under Stalin's rule. Meanwhile, Davchenko has played his role first in teaching the public to blame and hate kulaks and label them as evil oppressors. I think this is one of the examples when art is used for propaganda. Yes, and unfortunately, the director knows exactly what he is doing, manipulating the masses, while the masses are not really aware of this manipulation. We see how Vasil's face turns demonically angry when he talks about taking away land from the Kulaks and finishing them off. He feels no remorse for his intentions and actions, even when his father tries to explain to him how wrong he is. 
We can see that Dashenka meets his audience at their level when he shows Vasil's father trying to talk his son out of his convictions, yet Vasil remains unpersuaded. He calls his father old. Just as he disrespected the way of life of his grandfather, he thinks he knows better than previous generations because he is now empowered by the Bolsheviks and their Marxist ideology. Vasil's friends, in response, try to convince his father that their trust in Bolsheviks is the right way to go, that industrialization and collectivization will improve the living and working conditions of the entire village. The father's initial response is that of an average Ukrainian peasant. He is sarcastic about the cell's activities and suspicious of the intentions of the party officials in the city who represent the Soviet government. Let's see how Dashenka will develop this character further. It is interesting to observe that at first the audience only sees the father's back on the screen, yet by the end of the conversation between Vasil, his friends, and Vasil's father, he finally turns around and faces the camera with a smile. Do you think it's a foreshadowing technique? Certainly. Davshenka attempts to introduce an element of sorrow and humor at the same time. We see that the old man Petro misses his friend who has just passed away, and at the same time, the director's intentional irony is evident when Petro is trying to listen to the grave. On another side, the younger generation is represented by the teasing boys. It is interesting to see how the richness of meanings in the old Russian word Drasvoitiz is used here. 
Yes, since it can be translated both as live a healthy life and hello, the boys yelling to the old man can be interpreted ambiguously. Yes, as if they are teasing him and encourage him to move on from his old ways and abandon his beliefs in the afterlife. It is no wonder Petro yells back at them and calls them witches. In a traditional sense, the boys actually show their disrespect not only to Petro, but to God himself, and this is understood by a Ukrainian audience. The scene of the arrival of the tractor is significant. It shows the division within the village itself. Those who support the Soviets are cheering and are excited about the tractor moving, while those who are opposed to collectivization and industrialization of the village are happy when the tractor stops moving. The plot continues to develop with another significant detail at the office of the chairman of the collective farm. Definitely. The audience is manipulated to believe that Kulogs are the only evil that holds the village from running a successful collective farm. Taking away someone's property in the name of the collective good is presented as a virtue. The audience is continuously manipulated to think that Kulogs are to be hated and stripped of their property. No one is allowed to question if it is right to take away property from someone who worked hard to earn it. Even this way of thinking is punishable by Soviets.
Another detail at the office of the collected farm chairman. He accepts orders from the Communist Party officials who are located in the city. This fits the Soviet hierarchy perfectly. In their minds, the village had the right to exist only as the food supplier for the city. The workers in the city were the main builders of the communist society. Yes, the urban centers were key to Marxists. They relied on them as the main driving force of socialist slash communist ideology. While in the countryside, the village and its peasants were treated as uneducated, backwards, stuck in the past masses who had to be controlled by, so to speak, more advanced educated party officials from the city. Oh, that's an interesting way of fixing a tractor. I think we all understand what they're doing. Wouldn't it just be easier to bring water from the village? Yes, but that would be a more traditional way. <laughs> I see. So here are the new ways. Definitely not traditional ones. Yep. <laughs> The conflict is rising with the argument between Hama and Vasil. Of course, Vasil represents communism, while Hama represents the so-called enemy class of Kulaks, who refuse to accept collectivization.
As the work in the field begins, Davchenko contrasts the old ways and the new ways of working the land. Vasil yells to his father to drop his scythe, which he now calls a useless stick, because the tractor is a new tool to use. We observe happy villagers working hard in the fields. The director creates a beautiful scene of success and cheer. You might say Dovchenko is writing his ode to the Soviet village.
After the end of the day of hard work, Davchenko returns to his poetic depiction of village life. We see young couples dating, and all of them are inspired by the new way of life. These shots are mixed with beautiful scenery. Do you get the feeling that the director contrasts Vasil's dance to the dance by Drunken Hama? I do. However, in reality, it would be much more realistic not to see Hama drunk, because most of the Pulags belong to the old believers of the Orthodox Church, which means that they never consumed alcohol to begin with. The villagers who supported Soviets, on the other hand, suffered from chronic alcoholism. Well, I think it is again more propaganda against Pulags. This idyllic scene of joy and celebration is interrupted by the sound of a gunshot. Vasil is killed. The murder of Vasil becomes the culmination of the conflict and is used by the director as the ultimate message to justify the persecution of Kulaks. Class hatred was encouraged by films like Simna. Which brings us to another point, the responsibility of an artist to his audience. How often do talented artists abuse their power to influence their followers? Unfortunately, Davshenka was one of them. It goes without saying he was a talented director, but did he have the right to use his talent for propaganda like this? The audience is persuaded that collectivization is a necessary step forward, that Kulags are their enemy. Even Vasil's father is now ready to accept a new way of life, and there is no dissent in the village. Vasil will be hailed as a fallen hero, but his mission and belief in communism will live on in the film.
Another interesting moment, which is again an element of propaganda, is Vasil's father's rejection of God. The scene with the priest allows Davchenko to degrade and cancel Christian beliefs in general. This was hailed by the Soviet government, whose intent was to destroy any religious thought and convert everyone to atheism.
priest's prayer to God, when he asks God to punish unbelievers, is described as action similar to a village's witch. Um, this is something that is hard to translate precisely into English, so we will let it be lost in translation. Yes, the use of the verb naklikayat is telling here. In Russian, naklikayat is usually used when describing actions of a witch calling for trouble. And then his prayer is contrasted to Vasil's burial ceremony, when the whole village is gathering in this new type of burial, singing communist songs, embracing the socialist way of life, and the priest's prayer is useless. And the only one who is punished is Hama, the Kulak. Well, we know how severely the people of the USSR will be punished in reality, though. It will take more than seven decades of misery, lies, propaganda, oppression, constant persecution, killings and executions, and destruction of their culture and belief. And it's hard to say that Russians are a successful nation of free people today, either. Mm -hmm. Modern Russia has inherited many ill features of the USSR, and... Well, it will take much more time for the nation to recover, if it's possible for them to achieve this at all. So, what are your thoughts about this film? I think that, although it was definitely not uh, Dashyankov's intent to show the reality of the Ukrainian village um, of the 1920s through 1930s, his talent could not ignore it, and so we definitely see a few glimpses of reality through these smoked mirrors of the propaganda here. I agree. Knowing the history of the USSR and what those villagers had to go through then and later, I think this movie, inadvertently, has you realize that the solution is not in technology and Marxism. Whether it is a tractor then, or a robot today, whether it is Bolsheviks then, or neo-Marxists pushing for ultimate urbanization and radical environmentalism, supported by someone like Bill Gates or the Project Venus founder, these will be failed attempts that could lead to disastrous consequences. I cannot agree more. Whether it is scientific communism and atheism then, or the degradation and destruction of religious thought today, the further we try to move a human being from land and God, the more we will destroy our culture. And I would agree with you here as well. I think these two things, having land on which you can grow your own food, feeling responsible for taking care of it, not polluting it, but actually taking care of it, would also connect you with nature. And having a strong belief in God would give you moral strength and keep you away from the unfortunate tendencies and sins that so many educated people keep falling for when they think they can tell others how to live their lives and that their way is the only right way. So, how would you rate this film? How, how do you rate propaganda? <laughs> um, seriously, though, for its poetic lyricism, I would give it 4 out of 5 for sure. It was a powerful movie for those times. I agree. However, for the fact that it is full of historically inaccurate slander and propaganda, and for the fact that it was used as the foundation for Stalin to justify mass executions of old believers and kulaks in the USSR, I would honestly give it a 0 out of 5. Well, that's fair. <laughs>